and uh, but we'll we'll uh, we'll attempt to do that. Okay, so here's the first question, Andrew. What's the academic? I reserve the right to refuse to answer <laughs> any question I don't want to. You know, we got we got quite a few doctrinal questions here, but we're going to try to answer some Karis, uh campus questions first. What is the academic workload like? Well, I don't know. I, I could answer that. You could okay, answer that. Okay, I can better answer that. Good. Um, it's tough. <laughs> no. My class is the easiest. No. I figure that life is going to give you tests, and so yeah. I never made a test, and and we had to give tests in order to meet right. the VA stuff. So people took my lessons and made tests out of it. I don't. I don't even know. No, how to we, make a mo test. most of our tests are uh, true false, multiple choice. And we don't have a lot of homework. We don't have a lot of uh, uh, outside reading. Uh, when you get into third year, like practical government and some business and some other things, you'll have you'll have a greater workload. But when you when you come, we're we're not trying to we're not trying to uh, test your patience or you know your uh, whatever your I IQ is. Uh, we're we're just coming to learn the Bible, and so it's not difficult. Anybody can do it. Are you breathing? Are you alive? If God's called you to do it, you lean into his grace and you're, you're going you're to do fine. I suspect that that was an older person that asked that because we've had some older people that came and they're just terrified, thinking, I can't do it. I've, it's been so long since I've been in school and it's really not that bad. Okay, um, I put a picture of the speed limit at Karis on my Facebook page. <laughs> And one of my friends thinks it's referring to Luke twenty two fifty three. Is that correct? Did you know the way that came to pass was they had a 15-mile-an-hour speed limit here, and I said, who put this 15-mile-an-hour speed limit? And I forgot what they said, but they, they said, it's your place. You can fix whatever you want. And I said, well, it ought to be 25 or 20 or 25. And they said, well, which do you want? And I said, well, make it 22 and a half. And then I said, how about 22.53, just because I've never set a speed limit in my life, and I wanted to. And there's no significance to it whatsoever. There's only two verses in the Bible that have chapter 22 and verse 53, and both of them are real negative. The one in Luke is about it's the hour of darkness and something like that. And there's no significance to it whatsoever. I just did it to be silly. Okay, here's uh, someone must be uh, from uh, our generation or older. I don't know much about computers. Would that be a problem if I come to Karis Bible College? No. How's that? No, we, we have, it's great. I'm going to amplify. <laughs> okay, uh, we, we give you a hard I'm copy. I'm King James. He's the amplified. Yeah. <laughs> Praise God. Okay. So the amplified answer to that is that we, we provide the hard copy syllabi, but you can, or, you know, syllabus, you can, you can get also, uh, you can go online and uh, we have a digital. If you just want to put it on and bring, a lot of people do, just bring their, their tablets or their iPads and you get your curriculum that way. You, it's, your, it's your choice. Okay, so it's not, it's not a problem. We are moving toward online uh, testing and things like that, but we're, we're, going to, we're going to make it easy for you, any, any of you who are technologically challenged. All right. Um, what does Karis do to promote a family environment and relationships outside of class? Well, uh, somebody said teach the Bible like that was David and really it, the word of God will teach you to love one another and so that's a big part of it is just sitting under the word and we do like Lawson was talking this morning we do emphasize love and if you don't love your brother whom you have seen you can't love God whom you have not seen so we do a lot of that but then there's things that we do have in place like we have a care team that uh, like if you're new moving in here uh, you register, there's people, there's students that will meet you to help unload your stuff, to do things. There's people that just do everything they can. I think that I'm, I'm 
probably going to have to defer to Greg, but I know that we have students that kind of, second year students that are assigned to first year students to make sure everything's going okay if you have any problems. We have these groups that we were talking about. I forgot how many you said, 40 something. And there's just a lot of things that we do. And then there's a lot of people that do things on their own. And a lot of it really does need to be not organized, but just among students. But we do a lot to promote unity and love among the students. Yeah, it happens just, it happens in classroom. People connect with one another, build relationships. In fact, you'll build, build some of your, your life, lifelong relationships here at Karis. And, but we do have these uh, small groups. They're not mandatory, but over 500 of our 750 plus students are part of these uh, small groups. And then you can receive mentoring and connection and build relationships. And, and also if you're second or third year, you can develop your leadership and teaching skills there. So that we, uh, man, we the, these small groups are great. They they minister uh, to families and they 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 help you feel welcome and and uh, it, it, this is a this is a great this is one of the best things we have here on, at, at Karis is the, the relationship building. You know, as y'all could tell by these answers, that I I don't run the school. <laughs> I oversee it. They tell me what's going on, and we pray about it. In these small groups, this is something I came up with a couple of years ago that, you know, we need to be mentoring. So I have input and stuff, but really Greg and his team, they run these things, and um, so I'm not the one who actually runs the school. You're, you're he, more qualified. He comes up with the ideas, and we execute. There you go. Okay. Execute uh, the people. When is... When is <laughs> When, when is day school and is there night school and uh, is there a part-time option? So we have full-time day school meets from 8 till noon. We have uh, night school that meets from, is it 6 to 10? We mm -hmm. just changed it this year. So it meets from 6 to 10. And they also have part-time. And we've got Mark Jones as the leader of our night school. And I've actually talked to some of the night school students that like it better and some of them have transferred from day to night school and the reason they like it better is because it's a smaller group i think we have like a hundred or less well probably less than a hundred because some of them are part-time and aren't there all the time but uh it's a smaller group and they become really good friends and i think that there's one night a week that they all bring food and everybody you know and they just do a lot of things so it's a good option in night school you get the same things that you get in day school and uh the the instructors, the day instructors, have a night that they teach in night school. Now, I've been gone so much this year that they play a lot of videos, but I will be there next week on, I think it's Tuesday night. And so uh, you'll get the live speakers along with uh, DVDs. It's good. Awesome. Okay. And then when, do the, when is the fall term and winter term? There are two terms that we have that uh, you, can, you can start school. And... Um, and I'll just answer that. September 6th is right after Labor Day. And then November 28th is when the winter term starts. And if you come in the winter term, what happens is you go through the school. You start with where the first year class is in November, which is the second semester. But then during the summer, you have to take um, summer school. And you go back and through DVDs, you catch up on what you missed during the first trimester. And again, people have really liked that because... Uh, they're watching DVDs, and if they have a question, they'll stop, and they'll discuss it with the person who's facilitating it. And so it's really been good. People love the summer school. Okay, is there student housing on campus? There is not student housing. That's one of the things that the Lord's shown me. I'm going to build 11 lodges. We aren't going to build big dormitories, but we're going to build lodges that will house 30 singles per lodge and they'll be scattered back here in the woods so that you won't even be able to see them when you come in and then we're going to build nine fourplexes uh, for families and stuff and so the, all of that's in the future we don't have it at the moment but that's something that we really want to do you can go on our website and I've got a I'm not sure what we call it uh, in-house we called it a 3d flyover and it's a artist rendition and we had the guy that uh, did a lot of animation for Disney. He was one of their leading animators, and he moved here. Jimmy Davidson, are you in here, Jimmy? Somewhere? He's working or something. But it, 
But anyway, uh, we've got that animation, and it's really neat, and it'll give you an idea. We've got all of these student housing and an activity center. And then beyond that, someday I'm going to build a sports complex. We're going to have a performing arts uh, theater where the you know stage will sink down into the ground, and you'll be able to have all of these things drop from the ceiling and stuff. So we got big plans for this place. It's going to be awesome. Awesome. Where's the best, ra- best restaurant to eat in Woodland Park? I guess that depends on what you like. The Murins from Norway love Denny's. They eat there nearly every day. And this Denny's is, is really good. It's better than the average Denny's. It used to be a different restaurant. Uh, breakfast, they got the Hungry Bear and Grandmother's Kitchen, which is real good stuff. And then they have... Um, uh, Mexican food would be La Fiesta Mexicana is close and then they have another one Casa Grande is that it and they have that and then uh, the most uh, expensive one is Swiss Chalet and the mayor runs that and we go there quite a bit and it's really nice it's great great food awesome what is the mission trip like in second year well, the, sec- the missions trip is one of the f- main features of this school. When the Lord told me to start this school, I didn't want to just impart knowledge. Uh, we really wanted to mentor and disciple people. And anyway, it's a, it's a long story. It's evolved over the 22 years that the school's been going. But the missions trip has always been one of the major things. And you have to go on a missions trip in order to graduate. And there's many reasons for this. But one of them is we have a different view of life than most of the world does. We've been spoiled. We have um, Americans think that the whole world is like this, and it's not. And when you go overseas and you go to some of these poor places and stuff, it transforms your life. It gives you a different perspective. So that's one of the main things. But then these missions trips also make you take what you've been learning and use it and put it into practice. When I used to go on the missions trips uh, back in the beginning, on the buses we'd travel around, we would have people give testimonies of what had happened the night before and things like this. And every time somebody would talk about how that they just dreaded this, they hated getting in front of people, giving their testimony or ministering or whatever. But after we forced them to do it and they drew on the Holy Spirit and saw the power of God flow through them, they just get hooked on it. You know, I don't know if Tom Decker is in here, but Tom Decker was a student many, many years ago. And he came, and I tried to talk to Tom for the first two years that he was in school, and all he'd do is shake his head. He was just a quiet guy. He wouldn't say much. And uh, anyway, he went on his missions trip, and he had to speak in a church service. And he just believed God got up and spoke, and the power of God fell so powerfully that the entire church fell out under the power of the Holy Ghost. And they were all laying on the floor, the pastor, everybody. And so Tom tried to get them back, and they were all knocked out by the power of the Holy Spirit, and he just got up and left. (laughs) And after that, Tom got fired up, and we had a need over in England. The person that was running it quit, and Tom said, I could run that school. And Tom and Leslie moved over to England for, what, two or three years and ran the school, and... I mean, it just transformed his life. Now, Tom, after all of these years, it's probably been over 10 years, I'm sure, since he graduated. He's back, and he's in our third-year program now. So anyway, what a blessing. And these missions trips literally change your life. And we've had so many people that on their missions trip, that's where God gave them direction for the rest of their life. I'm thinking of Dottie Hammond over in Kenya, and that woman is just an absolute blessing. We've got her testimony on our website if you want to go look it up. But, well, what a blessing she is. And when she went to Kenya, the Lord told her, says, you're going to live and die here. You're going to spend the rest of your life here. And she's been there now for 10 years, just transforming people's lives. So, anyway, missions trips are one of the best parts of the whole school. Yeah, and they average about 7 to 10 uh, 10 days. And um, we do a great job of training 
you and preparing you before you go on your mission trip. Michelle Patterson just does a wonderful job, and her team, Clay and her team, help you. They have meetings, several meetings together with your team before you go out. So it's it's really a highlight. We during our chapels, we call the different different teams up and we pray over them. And then when they come back, they 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 share usually in a chapel about what happened. It's really awesome. Uh, this is a similar question that we had a while ago, but uh, I haven't studied for years. Will I be able to keep keep up? Absolutely. Man, the Holy Ghost will quicken your understanding and bring all things to your remembrance. And so you just, you know, if God's calling you, God knows everything about it. And he wouldn't call you here if it was going to be a bad experience. So we help people. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm, things may have changed because, like I say, I'm not the one that runs the day-to-day -day stuff. But in the past, back when I was dealing with everything, we'd have people that wouldn't pass a test. And we'd let you make it up. We'd let you study and redo it. I don't know if we do. We do we do that now. <laughs> well, you can read. Yeah, you you get counted off if you. You you do get a deduction yeah. and stuff. But yeah. I mean, we're you're going to have to try really hard to fail this school. <laughs> we've actually had people that couldn't read and write come to school, and we've helped them, and we gave moral tests. I don't know if they do that now, but I'm just saying that we will do everything we can to absolutely accommodate you. You know, we've had, Andrew, we've had uh, people who, uh, for, uh, international students who couldn't, who had trouble with the language. And we had, we, we had students, uh, we have students that will meet with them and help them with their tests. And walk, just walk them through it and help them understand the questions. And, and, uh, and so, we, you know, and that builds a relationship. It's really, it's really awesome what happens there. So uh, you're not going to fail unless you just don't come to school. That's right. Okay. Um, is Karis accredited? No. And here's the amplified version. <laughs> Go ahead. We aren't accredited. Let me just say this, that uh, we just signed an agreement with King's College, King's University, King's University last uh, week, I think it was. Oral Roberts University, I don't know that we've got a thing signed with them, but the president of Oral Roberts University told me that they would accept credits. And so there are um, schools that are beginning to start recognizing what we do, and they will accept credits. Uh, we have, we actually give you a diploma, and the state of Colorado allows us to give degrees, but again, it's not accredited, and not everybody will accept it. And... Um, I understand that that's important to some people, but it is not important to me in the least. If it's important to you, we're accommodating these things, and there are beginning to be some things. But, you know, to me, this school isn't about being recognized by somebody else. It's about your personal relationship with the Lord. If this was an accredited school, I wouldn't be able to teach here because I was a college dropout. And so... You know, I would like to really teach in this school. So we haven't accredited this school. And some of our instructors don't have the degrees and the things that they need. And so this isn't about academics. It's all about practical relationship with the Lord. And another thing that I don't know if you've recognized this, but we don't ask our instructors to just teach certain things, we ask them, what is it that God has done in your life? What is your life message? What's your passion? And we let them teach the things that are important to them. And um, because of that, man, there is just a passion. There's an anointing uh, on this that you wouldn't get if it was just all about academics. So I'm not opposed to those kind of things. And if you have a desire to to be able to transfer credits and stuff. We are beginning to do some things to accommodate that, but I'm not going to ever compromise what, what this school is. This school, in my estimation, is the best thing going. And I've got two witnesses. I won't tell you who these people are because it's their testimony, but two people have come to me, and they've been associated with other schools, and when they got accredited they said that the thing just lost a lot 
because they had to start teaching things that they wouldn't have taught. They had to start doing things in order to keep their accreditation to meet this standard. You're having government agencies come in and they don't have any spiritual uh, heart or desire at all and they start imposing their things and they begin to start controlling and telling you what you can do and can't do and I'm not going to do this. This is a Bible college and we're going to respond to the Lord. Amen. And uh, they, they will, King's University now will, uh, for our second year graduates, will uh, accept uh, up to 18 credits toward their, toward a degree with them. And they're actually working with another Bible uh, school that where they're accepting up to 90 of their credits. Uh, just uh, they don't require them to change content, just the way that they... Um, the way that they combine their their courses so so it's more like a college credit hour so we are looking at that our dean of education rick mcfarland down here once you wave at us rick um he's really been uh doing a lion's share of of communicating with these universities and so those of you that desire that uh we're working on that and but we did find out that um that oral roberts didn't have a degree and and uh, that th that he's got an honorary doctorate, and and I think they're willing to give Andrew one. But you know, so. I have I've had people offer me a doctorate yeah. degree, and then this one guy in Chicago wanted me to come to I think it was King's University, but he, anyway, it was some yeah. deal, and he said they'd give me credit for life experiences, and with just you know a minimal amount, they'd give me a doctorate degree. And anyway, I tried to put this guy off, and all week long he just dogged me and kept at me and finally the last day he got in my face what's wrong with you why don't you want a doctor's degree and since he was pushing me i just pushed back and i said because i'd be like you <laughs> and i said you haven't talked to me one lick about jesus you don't love the lord to you it's all about who you are and what you've got and i said i don't ever want to be like you so i don't have a desire to be like that Amen. If you've got God. a doctor's degree, just praise God. Bless you. But I don't care. Doesn't matter. <laughs> that was a good amplified version, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, so what, what do I receive after two years when I graduate? A pat on the back and say, go get them. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but no, really, you... I don't think that there is a way you could put a price on what you receive here. I mean, we charge really a minimal amount. Uh, you know, Lawson Purdue was here with Aaron and I forgot what they were saying, but it's hundreds of thousands of dollars that people pay in tuition for a secular college and ours is just a, a fraction of that. But what you get here the passion for the Lord, the example through all of these speakers, the revelation knowledge of the Word of God, it's priceless. And we equip you. And if you stay and go for the third year, we now have seven different tracks in the third year that we have the best business school on the planet. Amen. I really believe that. We are the only school outside of Harvard on the planet that gets their core curriculum, and that's because Billy Epperhart, who's one of the guys in our third-year business school, went through the Harvard business course and made such a uh, friendship with the guy who wrote the Harvard program that the guy has given it to Billy for, so that we can use. And we don't use all of it, but we use some of the core stuff, and we adapt it uh, and stuff. But then we have Dean Radke come in, who took the limited to the world's largest retailer. And Dean Radke just speaks here and imparts all of his knowledge. And I don't know what he charges, but I, I mean, it's in the six figures that Dean would charge to go into a corporation and spend a few days there. And you get this teaching. Uh, Paul Milligan, who is our CEO, has, I forgot how many corporations, but thousands of employees. Uh, he did a lot of, all of the... Um, fighter jets and some of the missiles and stuff. His company developed those things. They had the contract for Air Force One and um, cleaned it and did all of these things, serviced it. And I mean, he's had these very successful businesses and you're getting this input from them that's priceless. 
And we're, you're getting it for just a fraction of what you would have to pay to go to a business college and you're getting better instruction because not only do you get the skills that you will learn in a uh, secular school, but you get all of the biblical things about it. And then we've got the performing arts, we've got the worship, we've got the ministry track, the missions track, media, um, I'm probably missing something. Practical government, we're just starting that and I guarantee you this is something uh, David Barton is helping me start that and we've asked David and Tim Barton, is there anything else like this in the world? And there's nothing else like this in the world. And I mean, so anyway, when you leave here, you're getting things that may not be a diploma that hangs on the wall and stuff like that. But I guarantee you, you are being equipped. And that's the whole focus of this school is to, is to disciple people and to equip you. And the third year, the reason we've amplified it and made it the way it is, is because even after two years and people got hold of the word and it changed their life, there was still a gap in between when you graduated from Karis and when you went out to do ministry. And there was just so much, like starting a church, there was so much you had to learn about a 501c3 and how do you do this and what are the laws concerning that. And then... There's a lot of, you know, every church nowadays, or ministry, uh, you have to be able to communicate over the web and through media and through things like this. It's just part of ministry nowadays. And so we were teaching people the word and they were inspired and equipped in that area, but they didn't have some of these technical things. So we started a media school. It teaches people how to write letters, what it is that causes... Uh, you know, people, what people respond to. And we teach instead of presenting your need, you present an opportunity. It's always about blessing the people. And there's techniques to do it in a godly way that doesn't impose on people. So we teach people how to write letters, how to do all these things. We teach in ministry school. Greg runs that, and Greg could give you a lot better picture on it. But we just are trying to do everything we can so that when you leave here, and if God has revealed to you what he wants you to do, you can go straight from here and be a success. And you do not have to go through the failures that we have. Our staff, we added it up at one time, and I'm sure I don't have this right now, but it was well over 100, 100 years of ministry experience, and that was many years ago. And now our staff has grown. I'm sure we probably have over 200 years of ministry experience amongst all of our instructors and we share plainly with you our mistakes so that you don't have to make those same mistakes I mean this stuff's priceless so when you leave here it's I don't know that the world would recognize that you're gonna have much but uh, I believe in the sight of God being able to deal with the devil being able to overcome problems and stuff you are gonna be super well equipped Amen. it's really going to be good yeah, we're, we're going to, in third year, we, we're going to develop your skill. And you're going you're gonna to go out of here with some skill to, to be able to take and translate into uh, staff positions in churches. Uh, if you have it in your heart to plant a church, we're going to give you, we're bringing, we bring people in that have experience in various ways to plant churches, uh, businesses the same way, how to start business, how to go in and actually move up the corporate ladder in a, in a godly way and, and bring kingdom principles there. In the business school, the ministry school, we, we break the uh, students up into groups where they have to develop business plans and ministry plans. And uh, some of those ministries and businesses actually now are on the field. We bring them back to share with uh, other students, and so we're we're seeing a lot of success come out of come out of third year. It's a, it's the best thing that God put in Andrew's heart, I believe. And you know the missions program uh, is led by Delron Shirley, who ran uh, Lester Summerall's school for 25 years, and he was the head of that school. But man, he I even interviewed him about running this school. But as we interviewed it, his heart is just to travel the world, and so. Um, anyway, he runs our third year mission school and you have the experience of a guy who has been to nearly every uh, country on this planet. He travels constantly and does things. And part of the mission school is uh, that in addition to the second year missions trip, 
in, in the missions track, you go to, I think it's the Dominican Republic this year. Yeah, they're, they're gone now. They're gone now. And you go for six weeks. And you have to stay there for six weeks. And you're under the supervision of this couple that's been there for many years. And they have a compound that you stay in. But they just immerse you into the culture. You have to go buy groceries. You have to go do all of the things. You get practical stuff that the average missionary, they get thrown out there. And the culture shock is so bad. I'm, I'm sure that Barry could tell you when he went to Chile and all of these things. Uh, there's just so much more involved than just knowing what the word says and things like this. There's all of these practical things. And so we try and give you everything that it takes for you to succeed so that nothing is a surprise to you. It's awesome. When I went out and pastored a church, I remember the very first wedding I was ever asked to do. And I did it and I didn't know what you had to do for a wedding. And I just, I, I didn't have a clue if I did it right. I didn't know if I got the right documents and I just, Jamie and I agreed and prayed that they'd live at least seven years. I mean, they'd stay married for at least seven years so that if it wasn't a legal wedding that they could be common law marriage and be recognized. I didn't have a clue. I was scared. And the first funeral that I ever did, I didn't have a clue what to do at a funeral. I was scared. And it wasn't all that good. There was only about five people there and I was still petrified. So anyway, part of our deal is you have to perform weddings. You have to do funerals. We've had students that are very creative and come up and instead of them performing a funeral, they just say, in the name of Jesus, be healed and raise them from the dead. And we tell them, no, that won't work. You've got to actually do a funeral and console the family and stuff like this. And you get all kinds of practical stuff. I wished I would have had this. I tell you, it's really good. Yeah, we give you wedding ceremonies and funeral messages and things. We uh, teach you how to do water baptisms and baby dedications, can do communion, all, all kinds of, any, anything conceivable that's, that's evolved in ministry and church, we, uh, you, you, get, you get all this. In the past, we had a funeral home director. I don't know if they still do that. But they have them come into here and they tell you about what happens and and uh, you know about what is proper and and the different types of caskets to buy and different things and stuff and I remember uh, when this girl died that I was talking about last night I went with the family to the funeral home and these funeral directors everybody was grieving and they said well here's this casket and it costs so much but you wouldn't want to spend that on your daughter and they start playing on your sympathies and mercies and they had them spending tens of thousands of dollars on a casket and stuff and you know this is where the minister is supposed to step in and help the family so that they don't have to make emotional decisions and things like this and so we have funeral directors come in and teach all of these things and tell you what is the proper thing to do and what the options are I mean that's priceless again the I don't know of any other seminary or Bible college that does this. They may, but I mean, we do everything we can to prepare you for success in whatever area you're going into. Amen. Um, do, do you accept international students? Absolutely. How many do we have, Aaron? We have 63. How many, where are some of the inter, international all of our students? International students Once you stand guys up. stand up, all the international students stand up. Awesome. And I tell you, our international students are some of the best students. They are just awesome. They bring a passion. And again, coming from different cultures, many of them recognize the value of what's happening more than a lot of our American students. And so, man, praise God, we got some awesome international students. Why don't you stand up, Aaron? If you're, if you're an international, potential international student, Wave, you wave at him, Aaron. See that pretty lady right there? You go see her. She'll answer all of your questions about uh, what's involved with, and there is a lot involved with, with applying as an international student. I want to know why Aaron is wearing a class of 2018 t-shirt. Advertisement. Advertisement. All right. Do you know that um, 
the, I, I just mentioned this to Andrew, the, the, the a unique thing about the class of 2018, you're going to be the first class to graduate in the new building here in phase two. Awesome. Do you accept VA benefits? Yes, we do. And we have, how many VA, uh, how many people are here on VA benefits? You stand up if you're taking advantage of the VA benefits. At one time, I think we had like 50 people taking advantage of it. Yeah, this. what do we have, 20 some? 33? 33. Well, maybe I was wrong. But anyway, it, and we've got full VA benefits. Uh, we, are, we are accepted with the VA, and it's, I think it's a fairly easy process. You just have to apply for it. How many graduates does CARA send out each year? Well, from the local deal here, we're graduating just in the 200s, 250 or so is what we've been the last few years. But worldwide, I don't even know. Do you know? No, we have 6,000 students in the system. Uh, so I would suspect maybe, yeah, maybe close half to, of those or something. Maybe cl about two th probably close to 2,000 or a little bit year. over than that per year. It's yeah. awesome. Awesome. All right. How much is, uh, how much is tuition? I don't know. You'll have to answer that one. <laughs> okay. If, uh, if you pay the full year paid in advance, and you know a lot of people do that because there's a, there's a discount for that. It's $3,600. If, uh, if, you, if you decide to pay per month, it's $445 per month. And then there's also a family discount. Um, it's $3,200 for each additional family member if they pay in advance, or $400 a month for each additional family member. Okay? Is that Amen. good? And, you know, personally, I think that that is super cheap. It's cheap. I really do. Our other people, we've had discussions about this, and there's people that find it hard to do that. But I guarantee you what you're getting here... Um, is worth a lot more. Than we, you know, we've uh, actually called some other Bible colleges, Andrew, and and uh, we're 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 below uh, the level that most most of them are at, especially those that provide what we provide. And so, what's included in that tuition? Well, the tuition is that that includes uh, all your that includes you you coming here and being able to come under the best teaching in the world. Uh, there are also some book fees and activity fees that will that will be uh added to that and uh so that, that how much do those amount to um if it, it's what is it vicky the what is it 350 or 400 something like that is it 500 total okay so i think it's about 500 dollars total and that 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 is all the um, activity things that you know the, that are involved your that involves your uh you know, access to the to the online uh, curriculum. It's uh, what else is involved, Vicky? All the activity, all the programs and guest speakers, and and so on. So it that, that that's about that's everything, and that's cheap. That's still cheap. And the second year missions trip, we don't charge for that. I think that if people cannot, for whatever reason, fulfill our requirements, that they can give towards a trip, but basically you earn missions points by serving the people that are directing traffic, the people that are ushering, the people that do things. You participate and you help put these things on, and uh, your missions trip is paid for. You don't pay for that. You you earn it by performing all of these services. Yeah. So that's another benefit. These missions trips, I don't know what the what the actual price on that is, but it depends on where you're going. But uh, I, they probably average $1,000 per person or something easy. Probably a little, it's, a, it's a little higher than it. What is it? Yeah, the cheapest one is 2500 so. so anyway, you get that yeah. free. What yeah. a deal. Well, you got to work for it. So well, yes, you, you got to work for missions, but you don't you have to work pay. for missions points, so. Amplified version here. <laughs> Whatever he said. <laughs> okay. Uh, now we're, gonna, we're going to get into uh, some doctrinal questions, a few doctrinal questions here. Um, why did Paul say women should keep silence in the church? 
This is used by many to intimidate women ministers. Man, that's a big question. I can answer that, but I don't know how to answer it quickly. Let me just say this, that all of the New Testament scriptures concerning women in ministry and stuff like this, if you look closely, every one of them is tied to the woman being in subjection to her husband, not to men in general. And I think that people miss this. Like, for instance, that scripture he's talking about, 1 Timothy chapter 2, says, I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the men. Not over men, but over the man. And really, this is no different than what the Lord says to a husband. 1 Timothy chapter 3, that if you don't have your wife and family in agreement, you shouldn't be the um, elder of a church. It's just talking about that a woman who is dominant and controlling her husband and her husband's not in agreement and stuff, she needs to be silent. And it's the same thing for a man. If your family's out of order, you shouldn't be a leader in the church. Now, anybody can give a testimony. Anybody can stand up and share, regardless of whether your life is together. But if you're the pastor of a church, you're supposed to be exemplary. And... Uh, so he put people in uh, authority who had their act together. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, when it talks about this, it talks about women are supposed to be in subjection as also saith the law. Let me ask you a question. Where did the law say anything about women not ministering? Nobody can show me anything. Matter of fact, you can show Deborah. You can show... Um, Ruth and you know there was lots of women in the Bible that were used of God. Miriam led the people out and danced and she prophesied. She was called a prophet. What does the law have to say about women? The only thing I've ever been able to find where it says as also saith the law is going back all the way to the Garden of Eden that the woman was supposed to be in subjection unto her husband. So again it's kind of subtle there but if you try and Figure it out. The only restrictions on a woman are that she is not supposed to be lording it over her husband. It's offensive. It's not God's system. I do believe in submission. Anytime you get two people together, you've got a potential problem. And somebody has to have the tiebreaker. And God gave the tiebreaker to the man. He's supposed to be the head of the home, not in spiritual things, but in physical, natural things. He's the head of the wife physically, and he, he should have a position of leadership. And for a woman to be dominant and controlling and manipulative of her husband is wrong. And every one of these scriptures, I, we could turn to them and I could show this to you, but if you would study it, I believe every one of them is talking about a woman being in subjection to her husband. And if her husband isn't in agreement, she should not be teaching. And I agree with that. Awesome. Great answer. Is God against female pastors? <laughs> no. Over in 1 Timothy chapter 3, where it lists the qualifications of an elder, it says you have to be the husband of one wife. It is very hard for a woman to be the husband of one wife and that's taking it literally but if you take it literally uh, there's a number of things in there that would disqualify a lot of people and I think that the point that's being made if you look at the way things were in the New Testament you know in the Old Testament people had multiple wives David had 13 wives Solomon had 700 wives 300 concubines Abraham had multiple wives and on and on you could go. So under the old covenant, the Lord said in Mark chapter 10 that he allowed these things because of the hardness of man's heart. But in the New Testament, he changed things. And he said that one man should have one wife. And so that qualification in 1 Timothy chapter 3, I believe, is not just saying that a person who's been divorced can never be an elder of a church, but I believe it was talking about that you need to have one wife at a time, not excluding that a person who had been divorced could ever be a pastor. And if you look at that and accept that, which I believe is what's being said, well then you have to recognize that this isn't just talking about one wife forever. And likewise, it, it just could be meaning that it, you aren't supposed to have... Um, you know, multiple partners, you, you aren't supposed to be living in polygamy. There needs to be one marriage. So anyway, 
say all of that to say that I think that a woman can pastor a church. Um, I'll probably get in trouble for saying this, but I think you're going to have problems because there are prejudices against this. And um, if a woman is pastoring the church, I had a good friend of mine in Durango, Colorado, that he pastored the church and his wife was like assistant pastor with him, but she was a much better teacher than he was. And so over a period of time, he just says, I'm going to put her in as pastor. So he made her the pastor. And she was his boss. And boy, he asked me what I thought about it. And I said, I don't know that I can forbid it. But I said, I don't think this is wise. This is just not a good situation. And anyway, he went ahead and did it. And long story short, she ran off with another guy in the church and split the church and stuff. And when I went down there to try and help him, he says, did you know the day that she became the boss at church? She became the boss at home. Says you couldn't, we couldn't turn it off. And everything changed. And it's just, it's out of order. Now again, I believe in submission one to another. Ephesians chapter 5, it says submit one to another. The verse right in front of wives be subject unto your husbands. And so I don't believe it's a one-sided thing. I don't believe in lording it over the wife. Uh, you could look at my marriage and tell that. I guarantee you, I told Jamie once, I was the boss and I didn't want to hear any back talk. And I didn't see her for two weeks. And then I could see her just a little bit out of one eye as it opened up. <laughs> Jamie is not anybody's doormat. Jamie will say whatever she wants to, but you know what? I would say that out of all of the things that the Lord has ever spoken to me, there's only been two or three things that Jamie really was excited about. When uh, I pastored a church, Jamie did not want to be a pastor's wife, but you know what? She says, if that's what God called you to do, I'll go with you. And Jamie stuck with me. There's not another woman on this planet that would have lived with me through the things I put her through. And she stuck with me and... Uh, when we started the Bible college, she was adamant, this is not God. You should not be starting a Bible college. And so I backed off for a while, but then, I mean, it was just what God told me to do. And as we kept talking about it, she says, if this is what God tells you to do, I'm in agreement. And now Jamie sees the benefit of it and she admits that it was God. But a lot of it is Jamie is a accountant type. She is not a visionary. Jamie wants our life to be planned out down to the last detail. She actually, we, she tried to make reservations at Disney World two years in advance. And the uh, travel agent said, we can't make uh, reservations. They don't accept reservations that far in advance. Jamie likes to have our vacation planned where every place we're going to stay, everywhere we're going to eat, she'll spend weeks planning a vacation and she enjoys the planning more than the vacation <laughs> I'm just the opposite man I, I I don't want to plan because if we get in this hotel I'm liable to like the one that's across the street better and I'll spend the whole time thinking oh man I wished I'd have been over there you know <laughs> and I just like spontaneity we are exactly opposites on things like this but Jamie has submitted unto me and she would follow me to the ends of the earth. She will voice her opinion. She'll let me know. We will sit down and have to discuss it until either she puts herself in neutral. I never just run over her. I've never ignored her opinion, but she will have to come and say, if that's what God wants you to do. We'll do it. And, um, and so anyway, I, I believe that that's the way that it's supposed to work. There has to be a tiebreaker in the family and so somebody needs to be the head and when you put the woman in in the headship and running and dictating and controlling the family it uh what's the right word emasculates the man or something like that it's just not good it's not a good situation so anyway I believe that you are going to have trouble Marilyn Hickey to me is a good example of a woman minister because Wally Hickey was actually the head of the church and if you ever knew Wallace and Marilyn Hickey, he ran the church. He was in control. He was the boss, but Marilyn was the greater teacher. 
So he let her have all of the visible ministry and most people thought that she was the head of the home, but she was in submission to her husband and Wally was absol absolutely the head of that church and they did things as a unit, but he was the leader and I think that that's a godly way to do it. So I have no problems whatsoever with a woman minister. Let me just throw this in. I know I'm taking a long time on this, but it's my place. <laughs> but... Um, let me say, we've had a lot of women come and say, well, why don't you teach us all of these things in school? And we need to have a course on women in ministry and do all of this. And we will refer to some of these things and we will give you enough scriptures and enough things to give you uh, answers and answer your questions. But I really, really, really think it's wrong for you to spend your time defending yourself and promoting yourself and justifying what you're doing. And I think that's the worst thing that a woman can do. When I went and heard Catherine Kuhlman, I was taught that women could never teach men. I was prejudiced against women. I went in there with a chip on my shoulder. And then, she, on top of everything else, she was just weird. She was a weird person. And there was nothing about Catherine Kuhlman that I liked. But I was an usher, and I had to take people out of their wheelchairs and out of their stretchers and put them in seats for fire code stuff. And I saw these people that I knew couldn't even lift their get up and jump out of their stretchers and run and jump on the stage and push their stretchers and push their wheelchairs and you know what instantly I overcame my prejudice against women in ministry because I saw the power and the anointing of God on them and so I would say to those of you who do feel called to do that and if there's a prejudice against you just what's the chaff to the wheat if Satan can get you over here defending yourself and promoting yourself and justifying yourself, he's got you to where you aren't preaching the gospel anymore and he wins. You just need to go on and you need to do what God called you to do and let the people who will accept you accept you and the ones that don't, let them, let them reject it. Amen? I think that's real wisdom and Amen. I've seen women that have a chip on their shoulder. Don't do that. Anybody who loves God and is responsive to the Holy Spirit will appreciate you. And those that don't, won't. Yeah, and we, and we deal with, with this in some of our courses also, Andrew. So it's, it's, this is great. And that's exactly what we teach. These things are written, not written to all women. It's written to women with husbands to deal, help make sure that things are in order. Uh, please tell us the process in which Jamie came alive after she stopped breathing. Well, this, we were in uh, Glenwood Springs on our anniversary, and we were going to walk up and see Doc Holliday's graveyard, grave site. We've been by there many times, and I've never been there. So we just decided we'd walk up there and see his uh, grave site. And as we were walking along, she had a camera around her neck, and she was looking at the camera and not paying attention. And they had put a drive in, and they took, this was a steep curb because it was on the side of a mountain, and it was a high curb and they had knocked it down and made a driveway and she wasn't paying attention. And when she stepped, she stepped off that curb and she was concerned about her camera. So she was holding onto the camera and didn't catch herself. And she fell and hit her chest right on the curb. And it just destroyed this camera. And anyway, she, she got up. I said, are you okay? And she looked at me and she goes, I'm okay. And then she was just gone. And uh, a guy who's a doctor on my board said that she hit her heart so hard, it just stopped her heart. And so anyway, she passed out. And there were people standing around. They called 911. I started praying over her. And uh, anyway, she, I don't know how long she's gone. It seemed like a long time. But it probably was 30 seconds or a minute. And all of a sudden, she just opened up her eyes and, and started recovering. And uh, she, they had called the paramedics, and these paramedics came and checked on her. By the time they got there, it was about 10 minutes after all of this had happened, and they checked her pulse, and her pulse was only up to 39. So I believe that her heart had stopped. And anyway, just prayed over her, and she came back to life. And later that night, she was just fine. We were sitting in bed, and she got to laughing. I said, what are you laughing about? And she said, do you realize that they called 911 from the cemetery and they showed up? <laughs> she said, most people would have thought this was a prank call and we just got to laughing about it. 
So I've now had to raise my son from the dead, my wife from the dead. I told my other son, I said, I'm tired of doing this. You, you know, stay well. Where does Karis stand on Calvinistic beliefs? You know, I'm, I'm not sure I can totally answer that because I've never understood Calvinism and Arminianism. I've had people talk to me about this. I don't know what the doctrines are. But the way I understand it, Calvinism is very sovereignty of God. God's in control of everything. And I am 100% against that. I think that Calvin was probably a godly man. I don't know where he got this doctrine from, but anyway, I do not believe that God controls everything that happens in our life. He has a plan for us, but we have total uh, choice as to whether we follow his plan or do our own thing. And I think that that is the worst doctrine in the body of Christ. Now, whether you call that Calvinism or whether that's only a portion of Calvinism, I'm not up on all that. I don't know. Will you write a book on your experiences over all the years? I love to hear them. I don't know. If God inspires me, I will. So I'll put it back on God. Every time I try to move forward in my spiritual walk, everything negative seems to hammer me at once. Is that just Satan being Satan? Or am I somehow leaving myself exposed? Probably both. I mean, Satan can't do things to you without your consent and cooperation. And I would suspect that a person who has, I mean, again, that's a short question, and I don't know to what degree Satan is hindering you, but if Satan is, I mean, if your whole life is just a wreck and nothing is working in your life, somehow or another, you have cooperated with the devil. But if you are seeking God with your whole heart, you can still have problems because we live in a fallen world. And uh, as I often say, if you never bump into the devil, it's because you're both headed the same direction. So I don't think you can just sit there and say that if you were serving God, you wouldn't have any problems. That certainly is not true. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. And so you can't say that you won't have any problems. But if you are just constantly living under problems, like say, for instance, in the financial realm, I can guarantee you it's because somehow or another you haven't learned or you aren't operating in the true principles of God because God will cause you to prosper. If you're constantly sick and if you have 30, 40 things wrong in your body, I can guarantee you somewhere you are not understanding and cooperating with God because that is not God's will. But you could have things happen to you. Just last July, I made a construction update over here. I got in my car and headed home. And somewhere out here on Highway 24, all of a sudden, I just begin to see spots everywhere. And I don't know what happened. I guess a blood vessel or something in my eye broke. And I had all of these floaters. And, um, you know, that was last July. And I still deal with that to some degree. But I just started speaking to it and saying, in the name of Jesus, I command you to clear up. And you know what? Every once in a while, I'll see something. But it's so seldom. It's so little now. I don't even think about it. And I just spoke to it. And I don't believe that I caused that. I don't believe that I did anything, sow seeds for it. It's just some things happen to you. You can, you know, as long as you're asking why, you cannot be resisting and fighting and asking why at the same time. First thing you need to do is just stand on the word of God and get healed and fight against things and ask the Lord, Philippians 3.15, if you're otherwise minded in anything, he shall reveal this unto you. Don't be close to the Lord showing you that you're doing something wrong. And if he shows you you're doing something wrong, fine. Make the adjustments. But quit being so introspective that you're always questioning yourself and, and stuff. So you will have problems even if you're walking with the Lord with all of your heart. But if you just are constantly plagued by stuff, I'd say you probably got something wrong. Something's not right. You're operating in fear. Great. This is good stuff, isn't it? So if we, and, and you know, when you come to Karis, you know, you get, you get Andrew every week, unless he's traveling, he's here teaching. So, so if we all get healed physically and we get raised from the dead, when do we die? 
You don't have to be sick to die. I've heard that question in, in different forms many times. And people assume, and it's because of this world culture, you believe you have to be sick to die. You don't. Jesus gave up the ghost. He just gave it up. And there's just so many scriptures. You know, I was just reading last week where the Lord told Moses that you do this, you anoint Joshua because this day you are going to, I'm going to, I forgot the exact wording, but anyway, he was going to die. He was going to walk up Mount Nebo. And the Lord told him the day that he would die. And I remember writing in my notes, if God told uh, Moses the day that he would die, God can tell me the day that I'm going to die. And so it's wrong to think that you have to decay and get feeble and weak Moses was 120 years old and his natural force wasn't abated nor his eyesight dim. And the Lord just told him it was time to go. And, he, and here's a 120 year old man walking up a mountain <laughs> the day that he died. He did not die because his body was give out. It was just his ministry was over. And he walked up there and died. You know, in modern times, E.W. Kenyon is a guy that... Uh, Kenneth Hagin and a lot of people have taken inspiration from, and he wrote a lot of books and stuff. And E.W. Kenyon pastored a church, and he never buried a person in his church that was less, I forget the exact thing, but it was around 75 years old. Any person who was sick, they got them healed. He raised people from the dead. He operated in the power of God, and he taught that you didn't have to die sick. And I forget his exact age, but I think he was around 80, something like that. And uh, the day that he died, he told his daughter they were eating breakfast together. And he's, he says, the Lord told me I'm going home at 10 o'clock this morning. And her daughter said, Daddy, don't talk like that. Don't say things like that. So he didn't say anything else. And he ate breakfast and he read the paper. And he was sitting there reading the paper. And at 10 o'clock, he looked at his watch folded the paper up, put it down, and he was gone. You don't have to die sick. Uh, Charles Capps just died this last year, and Happy Caldwell is a good friend of Charles Capps, and Happy teaches here. And Charles called Happy on Friday and said, uh, Happy, I just wanted to say goodbye. The Lord told me I'm going home on Sunday. And so Happy went over and spent all day Saturday with him, and they just visited him. And um, Charles went to bed on Saturday night and never woke up on Sunday morning. They found him in his bed and he was gone. You do not have to be sick to die. The Bible says, James 2.26, says the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. If your body, if the spirit leaves the body, your body dies. And Jesus gave up the ghost into thy hands, I commit my spirit. And the Bible says that you can go with long life while I satisfy him and show him my salvation. If you aren't satisfied at 80, keep going. Whenever you get satisfied, just give up your spirit and be gone. So you do not have to be sick to die. You will, you will see that when a person dies, they'll say, well, they died of heart failure in their sleep. That's because the world has to attribute something to it. And it's obvious that their heart quit beating. But that doesn't mean that they were sick or had heart problems, but they just always want to ascribe some cause to it. Sometimes it's just you're through. And you can go and you do not have to be sick. Awesome. We're going to do two more questions. Uh, how do I get out of the way to receive? Uh, I guess I have a fear of not receiving. How do I die to self? You can't die to yourself by yourself. You can't put self to death. You can make the decision. Matter of fact, you have to make the decision. God won't force this on you. But all you can do is decide to die to yourself. All you can do is express your desire to the Lord and say, God, you know, I always use Romans 12:1 because that's the verse that the Lord used in my life. And it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, as a uh, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And you have to present your body. You have to say, God, this is what I want. But then God has to make this happen. And with me, the Lord spoke to me, Romans 12, 1 and 2, 
Christmas 1967 and for four months I just prayed those prayers I prayed that I said God help me what is a living sacrifice what do you have to do and I sought the Lord and God showed me things God began to work in my life but it was March the 23rd of 1968 when God showed up and consumed my sacrifice in a sense I had climbed up on the altar and I was laying there saying God make me a living sacrifice, but God's fire fell on March the 23rd, 1968, and God just did something in me that I couldn't have done to myself. I tried to die to myself. I was raised in a denomination that taught about this, and I literally heard a guy talk about it like every morning you ought to envision yourself getting strapped into an electric chair and dying to yourself. And name all of your sins and all of your failures. And I did this for a while. I would physically sit there and I'd strap it in and say, pride, selfishness. And I'd remind myself of all of the things and just think of all of my ungodliness, thinking that was dying to yourself. And what I was doing was resurrecting self. I was focused on self. I went through the whole day thinking about self, about what a jerk I was. And that did, I didn't die into yourself. What actually happened to me was after I just said, oh God, I want to be Romans 12, 1 and 2. What do I do? And I sought him. God showed up. God consumed me in a moment, time, moment of time. And God did something that I couldn't do for myself. So again, I don't know exactly how to answer that. You have to make yourself available. God is not going to force himself upon you. He will protect you're right to be carnal. You know, we've been spending all of this week trying to encourage people to believe God, hear from God, step out, take a step of faith, and do things like that. But if we ever did anything that violated your free will and we tried to force you and we're going to make you sign up, we're going to lock the doors and until you put in a $100 deposit, we aren't letting you leave. I guarantee you God would fight against us for that. God will never force anything upon you, ever. So you have to invite the Lord in. He's standing at the door of your heart knocking. You have to open up and invite him. You have to express, God, I want to be a living sacrifice. I want to live for you more than I want to live for myself. But you start the process. You choose, but he's the one that has to make it happen. And it'll happen differently for every single person. He will tailor make it to you, but I can promise you, God wants you to be surrendered to him more than you want to surrender to him. And if you will just, you know, open up the door a little bit and invite him in, God will begin to work and he will make it come to pass. I can guarantee it. Awesome. Last question. Is a baby born with sin? And if it is, uh, is the nature of sin, please explain. Yes, a baby is born a sinner. They have a sin nature. But that this would lead to a number of wrong thinking. For instance, the Catholic Church says that everybody's born with original sin. So this is the reason they baptize, sprinkle babies to purge them of this original sin. And then they have confirmation. And not only the Catholics, but you know, Lutherans and others will go through this same process. It is true that we were all born in sin. Uh, David said in Psalms chapter 51, in sin did my mother conceive me. And that's not talking about that it was an illicit relationship. It's just talking about that since man sinned, every child that has been born in this earth was born with a sin nature. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, there's just Romans chapter 5 makes this really, really clear. Uh, it says five different times in Romans chapter 5, if through one man's disobedience all became sinners, then likewise through one man's obedience all become righteous. And there's five different times there in Romans 5, Ephesians chapter 2 and other places, we were all born with a sin nature. But in Romans chapter 7, Paul said, I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And you put that together with Romans 5, 13, until the law comes, sin is not imputed where there is no law. Then what that means is, even though we were born with a sin nature, and you see children from a very young age acting in sin and expressing 
this sin nature, if they were to die before the law comes. And, you know, that's the scriptural terminology. Sometimes today people call it an age of accountability where you get to where you really understand that I'm not just doing something that my teacher told me not to do or my parents told me not to do, but I am transgressing against God and I am going to willfully disobey God and you willfully enter into sin. Until that time happens, if a child was to born, um, die, even though they were born with a sin nature, it's not imputed unto them until the law comes. So a child, you can see this in 2 Samuel chapter 12, um, when David sinned with Bathsheba, the child that was born unto them died. And they came and uh, David, he grieved for seven days, but finally when he saw that the child was dead, he just got up, he, he cleaned himself, he dressed, he ate, and they were shocked. While the child was alive, you grieve, but now that he's dead, it's just like nothing had happened. What's wrong? And he says... Uh, as long as he was alive, I thought maybe God would have mercy on him. So that's the reason he did that. But he says, once the child was die died, he said, there's no point. He says, I will go to him, but he will not return to me. And I can guarantee you, David didn't go to hell. When he was talking about this child you know, being in a place, someday David would join him. That, that was showing that that child, even though he had a sin nature, it wasn't imputed unto him. Children, when they die up until the age of accountability, do not have that sin held against them. So, um, and I believe that this age of accountability, people have tried to put a time on it and say that it's 12, 13 years old or whatever. I don't think you can put a time on it. It depends on how they've been brought up, what they've been exposed to how the word's been presented to them. I believe that some people with mental disabilities could be 50 years old and never have come to an age of accountability because they don't know what they're doing. So I don't know that we can ascribe a time to it, but the Lord knows what's happening and Amen. he'll be merciful. Amen. Hasn't this been rich? Let's tell Andrew we appreciate him taking the time to share this with us. And I wanted to uh, ask Andrew to... Uh, just encourage those that are still in the valley of decision to uh, to make the decision, and, we, and uh, we'll give him time for that. But I wanted to give you a couple of scriptures in, in Psalm 121.8. For those of you who have made, have made that decision, and those of you who are considering it, God said he, he will bless you in your going out, and he'll preserve and bless you in your going out and your coming in. And Psalm 138, 8 says he'll per perfect every detail that concerns you. So, you know, you make the commitment, and God, it's God's responsibility to bless, as you follow him. He's going to bless your going out, all the, all the details of selling your house or doing, doing whatever you have to do. He's going to perfect. Do you believe that? He's going to perfect every detail that concerns you, and he's going to bless your going out and your coming in. One day you'll leave, one day you'll be here. And man, you, you will never regret that decision. Praise God. So let me ask how many have um, signed up? Man, that's awesome. So let me ask this question. How many of you know you're coming but you haven't signed up? And how many are not sure whether you should come or not? You're still debating. Let me see your hands. So it looks like there's just a few of you that are still debating about it. Others know that they're coming. They just may not know the timing or something like that. But, you know, we've already said just about everything, I guess, I can say. Uh, I've tried to encourage you. Let me share one last thing with you. Some of you have heard me say this before, but to me, this is a powerful truth. And so I just want to share this with you real quickly. I got a teaching on Elijah that will go into a lot more detail. But in 1 Kings chapter 17, Elijah just shows up on the scene. He walks up to Ahab and he said, there's not going to be dew or rain for years until I say so. And the context of this is Ahab and his wife Jezebel had been killing anybody who claimed to be a prophet of the Lord. 
So for Elijah to walk up to him and say this showed a tremendous amount of boldness and confidence on his part. And he poss possibly could have been killed for it. And yet he just walked up and prophesied this. And in verse 2 it says, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying... And so the next thing that is shared is about how the Lord was going to protect him. He sent him to this brook Cherith, and he had ravens come and bring bread and flesh every morning and every evening. And so the Lord gave him protection. Now that he had made this prophecy to Ahab, he was like in the bullseye. He was, uh, you know, in the sights of Ahab. But here, here's a great truth, and this would apply to a lot of people here that Elijah didn't get this word from the Lord about his protection and how he was going to sustain him until he had already acted on the first word that God gave him. And this is a mistake that I see people make all of the time. They know God is telling them to do something, but then they get to thinking, all right, if I do that, well, then what about this? What about that? How are you going to work this out? And they want steps one through ten. And they hadn't even acted on step one. And because God loves us so much, I don't believe he gives us step one through ten because if you don't obey, now you're guilty of disobeying ten things he told you to do. He just is going to give you one thing. And if you obey that, then he'll show you the next step and he'll show you how this works. But there's so many people that they just want God to explain everything so that there's no faith involved in it. And that's not the way that the Lord works. So he gave Elijah the first word, and it was only after he had been faithful and delivered that that God gave him the second word. And then look at this. The Lord, as he spoke to him in verse 3, it says, Get thee hence and turn thee eastward and hide thyself by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. God says, I have. It was already done. And God commanded the ravens to take the food there to where he told Elijah to go, not to where Elijah was. And here is another, this is an awesome truth, man, that has just changed my life. That God doesn't send your provision to where you are. He sends your provision to where he told you to be. It's like in football. The quarterback doesn't throw the ball to where the receiver is. He throws the ball to where the receiver is going. And if you're sitting there saying, all right, God, you told me to come to Karis. I'm sitting here waiting on you. You give me the provision. You give me all the things that I need. You give me a job. You give me a house. You give me all the money, and then I'll go. God is sending the provision here. There is a place called there for every person. And if you aren't seeing God's provision, it's because you aren't all there. You got to go there. You know, this is my place called there. I'm where God called me to be, and because of it, there's supernatural provision. When we moved from a little office on Robinson Street that had 14,600 square feet in it, God told me I was thinking too small. Our next move was to 110,000 square foot building that had to be finished out inside. $3.2 million to buy the building, $3.2 million to refurbish it. It was huge. The utilities on that building down in Colorado Springs were more than my payments had been on the building over on Robinson Street. It was astronomical, the difference. And did you know what? There was some fear about God, this is a huge step. What if I take this step and you don't come through? But you know what? This is my place. That was my place there. God sent me there. And when we got there, the finances were so much better that I had much more money uh, in reserves moving to the bigger place with much more demands, much more expenses. I had much more money in reserve than I did when I was in the smaller place. You can't evaluate it just on physical, natural things. You have to evaluate it on what has God told you to do. 
If God told you to do it, then that ought to be the end of discussion. You just do it. If it hair lips the devil, if it looks like it's going to kill you, if it looks like you'll never survive, just do it. You just do what God tells you to do. And once you obey, that's your place called there, and God will supernaturally meet your needs. He says, I have already commanded. He had already spoken to the ravens, and the ravens could fly faster than Elijah could run. So one of the ways that he knew that he was in the right place, this brook Cherith was miles long. How did he know exactly the right place to be? Because God had already commanded the supply. And when he got there, he saw the ravens with the bread and the flesh and all of this. And so he knew he was in the right place. God has already spoken. If God has told you to come here, God has already put everything in motion to supply your needs. And your place called there is here. And if you will obey and do it, you'll see God's supply. If Elijah would have stayed where he was, it's possible that during the drought, he could have died of thirst. He could have died of famine. And from his perspective, it would have been, God, I obeyed you. I got this word. I delivered it, but you didn't take care of me. God did take care of him, but he didn't send the supply to where he was. He sent it to where he told him to go. If so, and I'm not saying this to put a guilt trip or anything I'm just telling you the truth that if Don't